Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to the 2012 Royal Tyrrell Museum Speaker Series. Today the Royal Tyrrell Museum and its cooperating society are proud to present Mr. Jordan Mallon. Jordan is a PhD candidate at the University of Calgary. Jordan is originally from Ottawa, Ontario. He obtained his bachelor's degree in geology with a concentration in vertebrate paleontology at Carleton University in Ottawa. In the context of his bachelor's degree, Jordan did an honors thesis on sexual dimorphism in the horned dinosaur Chasmosaurus. Subsequently, Jordan moved to Alberta to pursue a PhD in biological sciences at the University of Calgary. For his dissertation, Jordan is examining dietary niche partitioning among the large herbivorous dinosaurs of Alberta, and he is expecting to defend his dissertation in May of this year. Jordan's research interests revolve around paleoecology, functional morphology, and evolution. He has conducted fieldwork in Alberta and Texas, and his research has taken him to museums in Canada, the U.S., England, and France. Today, Jordan will present the results of a research project he has conducted on Anchiceratops, a horned dinosaur that can be found here in the Drumheller Valley. So without further delay, I present you Mr. Jordan Mallon. Thanks, Rafael. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I, I can hear myself. So, Well, thanks for that introduction, Francois. Um, as Francois just told you, I'm, I'm right now working on my uh, finishing up my dissertation. So, um, But this work I did uh, is part of a, a sort of side project um, that ate up a lot of my dissertation time. Uh, but it eventually was published last year. Um, so I'll be talking uh, about this paper um, talking about ways that we, we deal with uh, variation uh, in the fossil record uh, and what that means for how we interpret uh, the ecology and, and evolution of an animal. And specifically, I'll be talking to you about Anchiceratops, uh, which is a horned dinosaur um, from Alberta, from the Drumheller, uh, or from the Red uh, Deer River Valley. Um, this guy's found between, uh, basically, between Morin and uh, Rumsey. Uh, on the Red Deer River. So Anchiceratops was sort of your typical large ceratopsid. It was a herbivorous dinosaur. Um, had, had the big frill on the back of the head, had the horns on front of the face, which is very typical for these large horned dinosaurs. What made Anchiceratops distinctive uh, were these big, large epiossifications uh, on the back of the frill here, these big triangular things. Uh, and then there's some smaller ones on the front that you can see here on this painting by uh, Tuomas Quavirin. I'm probably butchering his name, but I want to give him credit. It's a beautiful picture. <clears throat> uh, Anchiceratops, for those who's wondering, uh, means uh, near horned face, meaning uh, the people who published it thought it was uh, closely related to these other uh, ceratopsids. It looks very, it's kind of your typical ceratopsid. Uh, I think that's all I have to say about that. But I'll introduce you to the problem of variation in Anchiceratops. So uh, when Anchiceratops was first published uh, back in, I think it was 1914, by Barnum Brown in New York, uh, this was the specimen that he had to work with. Uh, and he gave it the name Anchiceratops ornatus, ornatus referring to the ornateness of the, the ossifications on the frill here. And then uh, 15 years later, a second specimen was found that was attributed to Anchiceratops. You can see it looks more or less similar to the first specimen. And it was given the name Anchiceratops longirostris, referring to the length of the rostrum, the length of the snout. It's got a fairly long snout. Unfortunately, there is no snout in this animal, so uh, maybe it's a bit of a misnomer to call it longirostris if we don't know what the rostrum looked in, like in this first animal. But these things were called two separate species, Anchiceratops ornatus, Anchiceratops longirostris. And these things lived at roughly the same time. Um, and just to give you an idea, this is a, a good idea of variation, specific variation within a genus. Um, an off-sited example is the uh, evolutionary, ra evolutionary radiation of Galapagos finches, where you get um, speciation from a common ancestor and then these evolve uh, different beak shapes mainly uh, that allow them to specialize on different seeds and different types of foods. So 
maybe we have something similar going on with Anchiceratops where we have this radiation of different species from a common ancestor to fill in these, these different uh, ecological niches. <clears throat> but a second alternative has been proposed where um, maybe, the, maybe we have only one species and in fact we have uh, two different morphs within a species. So maybe the big guy is a male and the smaller, more gracile morph um, is a female. You can see that they differ. For example, this morph here has very slender horn cores, whereas this one here, although the horn cores are missing, would have been much bigger. They're much more robust animal. And you can see this in the frill too. This frill here is much thicker uh, than this frill. It's hard to tell from the photos, but if you take the measurements, uh, this is a much more robust animal than this one. So it's also been suggested in the literature that we're dealing with maybe one species, a male and a female. <clears throat> and this pattern where you get differences between males and females is called uh, sexual dimorphism. So we see that uh, in the salmon here. Here's the male. It's very distinctive from the female. It's got sort of this long protruding snout. Uh, we see it in arachnids. Here's a, a, the male spider, the female spider, the same species. The male's obviously much bigger. We see it in mammals quite a bit too. Here's the male moose on the right, the female moose on the left. And of course, the male's got the giant rack. Um, so, you know, these, these would be obvious to see in the fossil record. Um, but I just want to throw in a couple examples here where the, the big differences between males and females are more... Uh, um, color differences that it's more difficult to pick up in the fossil record. So if we were to find these finches in the fossil record, I don't know that we'd be able to tell males and females apart necessarily because they mainly differ in, in their plumage. Here's this male goldfinch has much brighter plumage than the female. And again, soft tissue differences between uh, the male lion and the female lion. The male's got the mane that everyone's familiar with. And we have sexual dimorphism in... Um, Humans, too. Often the males tend to be uh, bigger, stronger. Females are more slender, <clears throat> more intelligent. <laughs> um, but it's not always obvious. It's not always easy to pick those differences apart. Sometimes the males and females tend to look pretty similar. So what are we dealing with in this case? Are we dealing with two different species? Are we dealing with sexual differences? Uh, it's hard to know. Um, maybe we're dealing with a third hypothesis that no one's really considered yet. Um, the, I guess the case that I would make here is that this, um, these two hypotheses, that we have two different species or uh, two different sexes of one species, they both posit this idea that we have uh, um, discontinuous variation uh, within the species. So we have basically two different morphs or dimorphism going on. Um, but the case I'd make here is that with only two fossils, with only two specimens published to date of Anchiceratops, um, no two fossils look alike. So, of course, you're going to expect to see uh, differences be between these two. And it's e very easy to posit uh, dimorphism within, uh, when you don't have a growth series or, or, or a, a series of more than just two individuals to maybe fill in those gaps. So there might be a third in, uh, option whereby these are just um, endpoints of a, of a graded series. Maybe there's no dimorphism going on at all. Uh, and as all the paleontolo paleontologists like to say, in order to test this hypothesis, we need more fossils. And uh, to date, we've only had two published examples of Anchiceratops. <clears throat> but it turns out there's lots more Anchiceratops out there. Um, that no one's really published on. So, for example, this guy here, beautiful skull, uh, this is on display here at the museum uh, out in the Ceratopsid Gallery. Uh, this guy's out at the ROM in Toronto. This guy is at the uh, American Museum of Natural History in New York. This guy's at the Field Museum in Chicago. This guy's in Wyoming. This guy's in Ottawa. This guy's in Ottawa. This guy's up in Edmonton. So, I, I suspect the reason why nobody summarized all this material before is just because it's been spread all over the place and it's been very hard to get to. Uh, but thankfully I got some funding, I'll acknowledge that, from the Dinosaur Research Institute that allowed me to travel around and to see all these specimens and to take notes on them and phot photograph them and to measure them up. So uh, 
we can use these specimens now to test this idea of whether or not there's actually two more Svankiceratops or if, or if maybe it's just a, a, a graded series of variation. I should mention that uh, the reason why these specimens are found all over the world was because back when they were collected in the early 1900s, uh, there was no provincial museum in Alberta uh, to keep them centrally located. So it's nice to have now the Tyrrell here um, where we can, you know, amass all of these collections into one place now. These, these remain where they are today, but new material coming out of the field is now stays at the Tyrrell, so we can easily compare um, differences between different specimens. And so just to give you an idea uh, as to where all this stuff's been collected, it's basically been collected mostly between um, Morin and Rumsey, but you get quite a few specimens down closer to Drumheller too. <clears throat> But, you know, it's only maybe, what is it, a half hour drive up to Rumsey from here or so? So, all along the Red Deer River, they've been collected, basically. So, in science, one of the sort of key stones or key aspects of science is this idea that we test hypotheses. <clears throat> and so, we can generate some hypotheses to test this idea that there's dimorphism uh, in Ankyceratops, be it sexual or two different species. So we can first generate a null hypothesis. I've rendered it as H uh, naught here, uh, which states that there is no sexual dimorphism, or actually I, I shouldn't just say sexual dimorphism, but uh, any dimorphism period um, within Ankyceratops. And this predicts that in fact, there will be continuous variation among individuals. And then we can generate an alternative hypothesis which states there is dimorphism present. Again, it shouldn't just say sexual. I should have just said dimorphism. And this would predict discontinuous variation among individuals. So we have these two different hypotheses set up. We can then go test them. And the way that I did that was I looked at all these different skulls of Ankyceratops and I just took a bunch of measurements from them, um, linear measurements of the skull, different aspects, mostly um, centered around the frill and uh, the horns here because often most of the specimens were missing the snout so I didn't take a lot of measurements from the snout. Most of the specimens preserve the frill and uh, what I want to do is compare those measurements and to see, what, see how they vary whether it be discontinuous variation or continuous variation. Whoop. So the first thing I did was a principal components analysis and what that does is I can, I can take um, multiple measurements from the skull as I just showed you. And then what a com principal components analysis does is it, is it takes that multivariate data and compresses it down to a couple of axes of maximal variation. So in a traditional bivariate plot, you might have your x uh, on the, your variable x on this axis and, and variable y on the vertical axis. Um, and you know what those axes represent. In a multivariate uh, principal components analysis, uh, this axis here would represent some combination uh, of variables uh, that, rep that um, maximizes the, the variation in the spread. And this second axis here would also, um, would, it, it, it maximizes the variation uh, that is tangential to the variation in, from the first axis. So, no need to overinterpret it. What you need to know is, is in this null hypothesis, um, if we have two different, uh, if, if it's all one morph, then we expect to see no clustering in the variation along those axes. Whereas if, if we have uh, two morphs, um, you would expect to see uh, clustering in those axes. So here there's no, uh, there, there's absolute spread and here there's, there's two morphs you're seeing here. <clears throat> Um, and when we actually crunch those numbers, here's, what, here's the pattern of variation that we see uh, in Ankyceratops. So I don't, I don't see any strong uh, clustering of these uh, eight, specimen, uh, eight specimens that I measured. Um, it's not a big sample size, unfortunately, but it's what we have. Um, you might argue that maybe here's a cluster here and here's a cluster here, but um, 
the within group variation of this cluster is relatively large compared to the between group variation here. I just don't think there's any obvious signs of, of dimorphism going on here. You could easily argue that this is one big cluster here and, and this guy's an outlier, but um, the point is there's no obvious clustering of these specimens in the PCA. I also did a second test, a, cl a cluster analysis, and what this does is it, based on the measurements that I took, is it forces these different specimens uh, into clusters, into what, what are called dendrograms. So you can see, so for example, in this null hypothesis dendrogram, um, you, you wouldn't expect any um, strong clustering at the base of the dendrogram, say between males and separating males and females, or species A from species B. Uh, and instead, you might expect a pattern more like this, kind of a comb-like pattern, where specimens G and H are more alike, and then specimen F is more similar to specimens G and H, and so on. E is similar to F, G, and H. Whereas in this alternative, in this alternative hypothesis, you would see big clustering going on at the base of this dendrogram, separating, say, males A, B, C, and D from females E, F, G, and H or species A from species B. So when we run the analysis, we can compare our results to these two alternate hypotheses. And this is what we get, again, with these eight specimens that I examined. Um, there's really no excellent uh, definition of, of two groups of animals. Um, the best dimorphic signal that we get is comparing these two clumps here, and then you get uh, the outliers on the edge here. There's no strong dimorphic signal going on here, though, I would argue. Finally, I did a k-means cluster analysis. And what a k-means cluster analysis does is you tell the algorithm at the outset uh, how many groups you're looking to find. So in my case, I'm testing the idea that there's two groups. And so I would tell the k-means cluster analysis I'm looking for two groups. And then what the algorithm does is it tries to cluster, um, it tries to create two groups with um, maximal between group variance and minimal within group variance. And because of the way that the algorithm works, there's, uh, um, the assignment begins uh, randomly. So you have to run uh, the analysis uh, iterate it maybe 20 times or however much you'd like to, to compare um, how consistent the results are. And if you're getting consistent results um, with, with, with respect to the groupings, then you can maybe argue that you've got a strong case for dimorphism. Whereas if your results are very inconsistent, then you have no strong case for dimorphism. So what I've done here to, to show this, um, these numbers 1 through 20 represent the number of times I've run the analysis. And so in the case of the null hypothesis, um, where there, there is no dimorphism, um, you'd expect to basically to get a whole array of colors down here. Th these, these different colors represent the number of uh, groupings that agree. So I'll just compare that against the alternate hypothesis, where um, you're getting the same clusters, the same clusters uh, recovered repeatedly, maybe with a few outliers here. But here you're getting different clusters every time you run the program. So um, this would be an excellent example of um, no dimorphism. And here we have dimorphism represented in the data set. When I run the numbers through, this is what I get. Um, very few of the uh, cluster pairs actually agree with one another. Hence, the color coding at the bottom is, is all over the place. You get a rainbow of colors down here. Again, more evidence that I think there's not strong uh, dimorphism. Uh, there's not a strong signal for dimorphism uh, in Anchiceratops. So, what are the implications of this? Well, I'm concluding based on these three different tests that there is no dimorphism in Anchiceratops. Rather, there appears to be continuous variation in the skull of this animal. So, I'm suggesting that. There's probably a single variable species, and that by priority, Anchiceratops ornatus was named first. So it's all just a single species. And there's not dimorphism, there's not sexual dimorphism going on 
within the species. It's probably all just individual variation. Um, no, pe no two people in this room look alike. Um, even when you take sex into account, different females will differ from one another, and different males will differ from one another because we're all, we're all individuals. <clears throat> so what? Um, we've determined that there's one species of Anchiceratops, um, but the story doesn't end there. Uh, I think the implications for this are actually pretty interesting when you, when you take um, a, a broader perspective on things. So Anchiceratops uh, comes from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, uh, which again, is a, we're, we're sitting in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation here in Drumheller. Um, and if we look in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, we, if we look at the spread of where Anchiceratops is found, it's, it's found in the upper part of Unit 1 here and throughout Units 2 and 3 and maybe up into Unit 4. Um, that's a span of about 2 million years. So we can say that Anchiceratops more or less uh, as a species span 2 million years. Um, I should plug Annie Quinney's talk in here. I think next week she's talking about um, paleo environments in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which would provide some more uh, context for where these guys live. <clears throat> but if we travel from Drumheller down uh, into Dinosaur Park, just uh, north of Brooks here, um, we're getting into ever older sediments. We get into the Dinosaur Park Formation. And in the Dinosaur Park Formation, um, the longest span of a species typically is about 300,000 years. So, so, for example, Centrosaurus here is a horned dinosaur that lived about 300,000 years as best we can determine. Centrosaurus apertus. And you can see the other species didn't even, uh, generally didn't last any longer than that. So the most these guys are, are, are living is about 300,000 years compared to the 2 million years in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. So Anchiceratops appears to have been a relatively long-lived species compared to the other species in the older sediments in Dinosaur Park. We're talking about a difference of uh, 2 million years compared to 300,000 years in the Dinosaur Park formation. Uh, so why? That, that's kind of interesting. If, we, if Anchiceratops is only one species and it's, it appears to be much longer lived than, than the species we get in the Dinosaur Park formation, why might that be? And we can generate some hypotheses uh, that, might, that might account for, the, for uh, the longed species lifespan of Anchiceratops. One of them is the Dinosaur Park Formation uh, has high species diversity compared to the Horseshoe Canyon Formation. And when you have a lot of species living together, there tends to be lots of competition going on between species for food resources, which results in high extinction rates and new niches opening up. And so this, there might have been less pressure for these animals to evolve in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which is why um, Anchiceratops might have been longer lived. There, there simply weren't as many species for it to compete with for food. Um, the other option is uh, that in the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, there might have been less habitat fragmentation. So, uh, in the time of the when the Dinosaur Park Formation was being deposited roughly 75 million years ago, North America was divided by this uh, western interior sea. And as the sea encroached on the land, as it expanded and encroached on the land, it probably created lots of habitat fragmentation. Um, and different populations were isolated from one another as a result. And when you isolate populations, this tends to produce um, uh, sexual isolation and creates new species. Uh, whereas in the time the when the Horseshoe Canyon was being deposited, uh, the sea um, was gradually um, receding and opening up new uh, land area here. Um, and um, so there was less isolation of populations. The populations were mixing and when you tend to mix populations it tends to create stability in the gene pool and uh, you don't get evolution occurring as quickly. So that, that might be another option as to why Anchiceratops as a species, Ornatus, Anchiceratops ornatus, was longer lived than these species in the Dinosaur Park Formation. Another option might be um, 
re might relate to generalist versus uh, specialist habits. So maybe the dinosaurs in the dinosaur park formation were um, uh, more specialist. So um, they had very narrow environmental and food requirements. So maybe what happened was when the environment changed in the dinosaur park formation and their food uh, disappeared as a result, they had to move elsewhere to find the same food. So you get high species turnover as species migrate in and out of the, of, uh, the area where the dinosaur uh, park formation was deposited. Maybe Anchiceratops um, instead was more of a generalist, so uh, it fed on a, maybe a variety of plant foods that when any one of those plant foods disappeared, it didn't have to migrate out of the area because it was able to subsist on uh, a different set of plant foods that it was also um, tolerant to. So these are just three ideas as, uh, that might explain the longevity of Anchiceratops. Um, versus the short-lived uh, species in the dinosaur park formation. Um, hopefully we might be able to tease apart these hypotheses and be able to tell which one is more likely to be true in the future, but uh, that work still is yet to be done. I should also mention some of the um, implications as this has for uh, our interpretation of the extinction of the dinosaurs too. So. Uh, in the, um, in the Horseshoe Canyon formation, we're not too far from the, the ultimate extinction of the dinosaurs when they went belly up at the end of uh, the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago. Um, and so if we have two species of Anchiceratops, like was originally believed, then we've essentially doubled the biodiversity of Anchiceratops um, at the end of uh, the Cretaceous. And um, that would have greater implications for the impact of the extinction. If, if you recognize all the different morphs as being new species, then at the end, of, when all these species go extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, uh, it's going to look like there was a, a mass extinction going on. Um, whereas if you tend to synonymize these species and reduce that variation down to say, variation within a single species, then the extinction doesn't appear as severe because you're losing less species as a result. So uh, recognizing how this um, variation, um, recognizing the source of this variation in these animals has major implications for how uh, the severity of the extinction of the dinosaurs at the close of the Cretaceous. So just some take home messages. Um, Fossils are variable, no two fossils are alike. <clears throat> and there are numerous sources for this variation. Um, it might be intraspecific or interspecific variation. It might be sexual variation within a single species, males being separate from females. There might be individual variation going on, which I think is the case with Anchiceratops, where we're just seeing variation between individuals as opposed to sexes. And some other sources of variation that I, that I didn't mention our geographic variation where, you, where you, um, there's subtle differences in the environment along any um, line, say going from north to south. So there might be subtle differences in, uh, say, the plants that these animals are eating and therefore the animals might exhibit subtle variation that coincides with that variation in the plants. There's taphonomic variation in um, fossils too, which refers to uh, how the fossils become distorted as a result of being preserved in the rock record. And ontogenetic variation, which is just variation um, in an as the individual grows up. So we look different from babies is, is an obvious um, example of, of ontogenetic variation. I didn't consider ontogenetic variation because most of these um, skulls that I was looking at in my study were more or less the same size. Um, some were slightly bigger than others, but we didn't have a, a broad spectrum of sizes that we could easily attribute to uh, the effects of ontogeny or, or lifespan. Um, paleontologists have ways of distinguishing between these different sources of variation, which I just showed. And how, we, uh, how fossils vary has important implications for how we interpret animal paleoecology and evolution and extinction as well. <clears throat> 
So that's the end of my talk. Uh, kept it short. Maybe that's a good thing co coming on lunch. But uh, I'd just like to thank my co-authors. First of all, this, this project wasn't uh, just done by myself, but with a series of co-authors. I'd like to thank everyone at the museums that I visited. Uh, da Darren Tankey, uh, in combination with the Dinosaur Research Institute, um, established this Tanky Neosaurotopsian Research Scholarship, um, which I applied for and which I thankfully won and allowed me to check out all this material all across North America. And thanks to the Tyrrell and to uh, the audience too for uh, taking me up on the offer to speak. Thanks.